Welcome to Good Dog Nation, the weekly video podcast that's all about having a good dog. Hosted by Michelle McCarthy, CDBC, CTAC, Leading Therapy Dog Authority, and owner of Canine Homeschooling. And Kim Merritt, co-founder of GoodDogInABox.com, GoodDogPro.com, and founder of The URL Doctor. This episode is brought to you by GoodDogInABox.com, reward-based dog training and dog bite prevention products for families with kids and dogs. And GoodDogPro.com, the online content subscription and community for dog professionals with reward-based dog training products, curriculums, and online courses to educate, motivate, and positively impact those that work with dogs. Now, let's join Good Dog Nation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the premiere episode of Good Dog Nation, the video podcast that will be covering all kinds of issues about dogs and the dog community. I'm Kim Merritt. I am the co-founder of Good Dog in a Box and Good Dog Pro, and I want to welcome you today. Let me introduce to you my very special co-host for this episode and for all the episodes of Good Dog Nation, Michelle McCarthy. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Hi, guys. Great to be here. So now let's get started with today's episode, Life-Saving Dogs Canine Water Rescue, and our very special guest that Michelle and I are both really excited to talk to, Maria Gray. Hi, Maria. Hi. So nice to, to meet both you, Kim and Michelle. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So let me give everyone uh, the Maria's bio because uh, it, it's really incredible. So Maria has been actively training dogs for over 20 years. For the past five years, she has worked directly with the SICS, the Italian School of Water Rescue Dogs in Italy, where there are over 300 dog handler teams that are certified to patrol the beaches there, and they work together with the Italian Coast Guard and fire departments. Her dog is currently the only American dog certified by the SICS. Maria runs a nonprofit organization called the American Academy of Canine Water Rescue and is supported by the SICS and is dedicated to eliminating unintentional death by drowning. She gives educational seminars around the world to teach people of all ages about water safety. And that's really, even though this is dog related, really the core message here is water safety. So Maria, you know, give us a, a little bit of background as far as how you got into this and what your original interest was in this subject. Oh, it's a it's a great question. It's a hard question, but but briefly, I remember being a little girl, maybe around six or seven, and having one of those golden moments where my parents actually let me watch TV because it was limited back then. And I think it was a National Geographic special or a nature channel. I don't even remember. But there was a special on PBS that was dedicated to these dogs in Italy that saved people's lives. And I remember as a young child, I grew up with a St. Bernard. And um, I loved the massive dog. And she loved me very much. Her name was Wolf. And I was watching this special leaning against her, looking at these dogs leaping off of boats and saving people's lives. And I thought... That's what I want to do when I grow up. Well, that didn't happen. I grew up and I ended up getting a PhD in chemical engineering and becoming a wife and mother. And, and I've always had Newfoundland dogs and I've always been a dog trainer. But until my daughter got to be, well, a little more grown up, it was not a dream I really could pursue. I was aware of it. I was consistently aware of it. And I've had seven Newfoundlands over the course of my life. And my most recent Newfoundland, my angel, he came into my life about four and a half years ago, and I got him from a breeder who bred for both a working dog and a show dog, and it was very serious. Um, I believe in rescuing dogs. I also believe in responsible breeders, so I'll do either way. I have a rescue Aussie in my house, and I have my, my pedigree working boy angel, so they, they all matter. So I got this animal and I just formed this incredible bond with him as we're all want to do with our dogs. And I thought I can do this now. I can finally do this. And so I contacted Ferruccio Pedenga of the Esquelo Italiana Con Sabotaggio, the SICS. We call it six. We pronounce the acronym. It's easier than saying the Italian or, or the awkward American translation. 
So I contacted him and I said, can I do this? And he said, absolutely, come on out. Well, I couldn't fly my dog to Italy. So I flew out by myself and they gave me like a substitute dog. <laughs> he was awesome. His name was Rambo. He's, he's a great dog. And um, I, he's a black lab. And I worked with Rambo and I took this intensive course where I learned all of these training skills that I had never had before. I know how to train a dog. I, I train dogs for therapy. I train dogs for pet manners. I, I've always done water work with my boys. But in the United States of America, bear in mind that water work with Newfoundlands is carried out as a sport. So it's a sport. You take a test, you get your trophy, you get your certificate, and it's awesome. And I celebrate it. And I am a member in good standing of Newfoundland Club of America, and I have nothing against them. But what I'm trying to bring to the United States is a very different philosophy. It's not about a sport. So at the end of the day, if we really do this, it's do we save a life? So we don't need rules that say you can't put your foot in the water or you can't double command your dog or you can't touch your dog. In fact, the Italians are all, touch the dog, hold the dog. They put these dogs on helicopters and they leap out into open water. They're holding their dogs. This is not a, I love the AKC and I mean no nothing detrimental, but this is not a test to see if you can't touch your dog. This is a bond between you and your dog to effectively save a life. Um, so I took that first course and that was, as I said, over four years ago. And then I made it my life's mission to figure out how to get my dog to Italy, which we have now been several times. And my Italian colleagues have also come here. Angel flies in the cabin of the plane with me. He is a legal for real service animal. And this is something I have to say right up front. Please don't go online and get an ESA certificate. If you deserve to have one, go to a real psychiatrist that you see on a regular basis and get that certification. Don't pretend your dog's a service dog. If he's not, it's not a joke. Angel is a trained service dog. I can demonstrate the service he's trained to provide for me. I told him I rode a cuff. It, it, he's a mobility assistance dog, and it's real. It's 100% legitimate. He does a bunch more, too. My dream is to get him to be a United States military dog. And to do so, I'm currently in talks with the United States Coast Guard. Um, and I'm really looking forward to doing a demonstration for them in the near future. But back to Italy. So back and forth we went. And I kept learning and training. And they blew my mind. They blew my mind because it was so different than anything I saw in the United States. For one thing, and I know we're not supposed to curse. It's really not a curse word. They have bitches and males together, adjacent to one another with no leashes, with no, they allow for some little bit of sparring with the dogs, but they are under full control. I think in this country, it would look scary, but I have lived it and breathed it. These dogs are so excited about going into the water, so excited about doing their job. They're barking and sometimes they even growl, but it's not, it's, it's not posturing, it's joy. They just want to go. So I learned so much from them. And I ended up having a back and forth. So each year for the past four years, two of the instructors from Italy have come to me to train here in Massachusetts. And I went there. And um, during that period of time, and I'm talking intensive training, I spent 21 days at one point, so it was two weeks at all at the limit. Um, I learned so much. I took several tests. I established a new respect for learning new things and seeing the different way they do this. And I was also just floored by the fact that they actually use these dogs in service. And I thought, you know, whatever you may or may not feel about our country, I still love America. And I want to bring this here. I really want to share this. There's a million ways these dogs can help save lives. It doesn't just, ha they can and do save somebody who's drowning directly in the water, off a helicopter, off a boat, off the shore. They also work prophylactically. In other words, they work as prevention. So if they're present on the beach, much like with a lifeguard present on the beach, people are more likely to follow the rules. And if you see this dog in his fancy life jacket and you know that he's there to protect you and you're a child or a grown-up, you're going to be a little more aware of following the rules. Sort of like the policeman following you when you're driving, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to be safer. Well, and I know, uh, but we, we've all had Newfoundlands. Uh, Michelle has one right now. My most prized dog was a Newfoundland. And I, I, di I did some of the water 
work with her uh, with the Newfoundland Club, like you're talking about, certainly not to the degree that you are with the SCIS, but I remember taking Holly to the beach and any, if she was not on a leash, uh, she was in the water rescuing people around, and whether it was my children, whether it was whoever was nearby, everybody was being rescued because it's just inbred in these dogs. And we always had, she just absolutely adored the water. Absolutely. And maybe, maybe now is a good time if, if you'll allow me to introduce the breed. You know, and, and Michelle knows, but not everyone knows what a Newfoundland is. Absolutely. So if, if you'll allow me, I'll just talk briefly. So a Newfoundland dog, Newfoundland, um, is also called a Terra Nova in Europe. And Terra Nova means New Earth, very similar to Newfoundland. These dogs were bred um, over the last several hundred years, originally utilized by the Vikings to leap off of boats and take the ropes from these tall Viking boats to the shore so that the Vikings could I don't know, park their boats or whatever the right terminology is. However, it was rapidly discovered that if someone went overboard, the new of his own accord or her own accord would leap off the boat and go rescue the person. So human beings, being as smart as we are, figured out, hey, let's teach this dog to rescue people. Their coat is incredibly suited for the water. They actually have a three-layered coat. So near down their skin, it's a downy, soft layer. It's almost impossible to wash my dog. It's incredibly difficult to get him wet to his skin. He's just designed not to get wet on his epidermis. Above that is a coarser, dense layer that keeps him warm. And above that is a layer of fur that has oil, a lot of oil in it, much like a seal. He also has webs between his toes, which allow him to do uniquely to the world of canines. The Newfoundland is the only dog who does a freestyle stroke. He doesn't do a doggy pat. He actually does something much more akin to a human freestyle. Um, they're incredibly strong. They're built for endurance in the water. So they're, they're well, oh, and I have to mention, they're the only dog that can go in Arctic water. However, that said, the Newfie doesn't rock the world. All dogs count. And any dog, I will consider in my academy and the Italians as well, consider any dog that's going to be over 50 pounds at full body weight. And it's not prejudiced. It's just you need the mass to rescue somebody. Any dog, whether you're a mixed breed or you're a purebred, it doesn't matter. If you have the right bond with your dog and this moves you, you could pursue water rescue. Shall we take a look at uh, a video that shows um, rescuing an unconscious victim in the water? I, I find this to be amazing. Let's watch and then then you can kind of uh, tell us about this when we're done. Sure, absolutely. So what you saw there, and I have much longer videos of that, but we want to keep it quick and show people. Basically, what really happened was my partner who's helping train, that's Valentina Pedenga. Um, she was here in Massachusetts. She's an Italian instructor. She went out into the water and feigned unconsciousness. So she just pretended she was unconscious. I sent Angel from shore very quietly and just told him, go. He went out located her hand and then he's got tremendous psi just like a ruddy just like a doberman this is people don't always understand this with the new funland the strength is there but his natural inclination is gentle gentle so he's going to hold that hand as gently as he can he turns her completely around and he brings her back to shore there's no screaming help me dog save me dog she's silent she is feigning to be an unconscious victim it's the bond between he and i where i direct him out to get her and it's his innate desire to save people so that's pretty powerful the unconscious victim rescue and it is utilized for real it's it's been utilized by the Italians to actually save people. One of the questions people ask me sometimes is, what about a baby? What about a toddler, right? He's a, my dog weighs 150 pounds. 
And you, <laughs> you think about the bite force associated with that. One of the things Angel and I do for fun is I throw raw eggs at him in the shell and he catches them and then he gives me back the egg. I didn't teach him to do this. It's, it's, oh, I guess I do teach it sort of, but that desire to not break the skin. And then to the people who really push me, I say, okay, so you're really drowning and he bit your hand, but he saved you. I have to, do you really care? Because yes. <laughs> he broke, you're alive to go to the ER. <laughs> you go get stitches now, right? He's got his rabies vaccine. No, I'm, I'm not even trying to be flippant. Um, there are people who ask me, do you understand that you might be asking your dog to risk his life? And the answer is absolutely. So do our first responders. So does everybody I, I, I meet and greet at the United States Coast Guard and the fire department and the police department. He's, he's in service and there is a finite risk associated with that. And we're proud. And I think if he could talk, he'd be proud to tell you he, he carries that risk. So, so can I ask, you know, jumping from helicopters, when you, when you talk about the risk, um, I think that's the most amazing skill. And if I was drowning offshore, I would be really happy to see a dog come flying out of a helicopter and save me. Um, but as you said, there's risk. What type of risk is there for a dog as far as, you know, going through that training process? And at what point would you as the handler and the trainers how are you able to tell if a dog is just really not suited? Just choosing, like, I just really can't jump out of this helicopter. That's an excellent, How do you notice that? that's an excellent question. So the model that I'm adopting for the American Academy of Canine Rescue, which is brand new. I just started this nonprofit last year. So I'm, I'm trying to echo what they do in Italy and adapt it to America because we're a different country. But in Italy, what I can tell you is, first of all, they reevaluate the dogs each and their handlers each and every year. Okay. So we're never resting on our laurels. We're never saying we did this two years ago so we can still do it. Second of all, the safety of the dog, the willingness of the dog is paramount. If the dog, we're not throwing the dog off the helicopter. We're not throwing the dog out of the boat. In fact, there's a beautiful video. I, 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 I've seen so many of these, but there's one that was showcased some time ago on TV, whoever did it. Uh, and it shows several dogs jumping off the helicopter. Then it's just a dog who won't go. And the video actually says, and sometimes you're not ready, but we love you anyway. So we're not right. tossing these animals out. Mm -hmm. It sometimes looks like that because they are heavily guided off the helicopter because there's right. an engine and there's blades and there's a storm. So you'll see two people who lift the dog up with a special harness and they guide him. But the dog, he or her, is willing to jump. If they're not willing to jump, they don't jump. And how do you know? Yeah. You know, just like you ladies know with any kind of training. You know, you ask your dog to go into the barn because you're going to teach it to love goats or something. And the dog's like, I ain't going in the barn. And you're like, okay, now we can back up and do successive approximation. You're not going to drag your dog into the barn. I don't know why the barn came mm. into my mind. But just like any other training, just because it's big and special, it's a helicopter, it makes no difference. We're going to take a cue from the dog because we love the dog. So if the dog is not engaged, if he's not happy about doing this exercise, we're going to back up. And some dogs will never do it. And that's okay. And I want to be very clear about the helicopter. Um, in point of fact, my Italian colleagues recently made this very clear to me. I don't want to misrepresent it. They save lives every year in Italy. They don't save them by jumping off of helicopters. The helicopter is primarily, first of all, they're super expensive. And second of all, they're utilized basically to mimic, if you will, a storm. So the dogs do go out in hurricanes and harsh weather, et cetera, to save people. You Sadly, you didn't pay attention to the rules and you drank too much and you went out on your kayak in the middle of impending weather. Now I have to go save you and it's stormy and there's thunder and there's lightning. We don't typically train in thunder and lightning. Why? Because it's dangerous. But that's a place you need to be able to save people. Utilizing a helicopter creates a storm. 
So when you're above the water and your dog's on that helicopter, those blades are spinning below you, you're getting hit. It actually hurts the, the droplets of water and you can't hear anything. And it's basically a controlled storm, if you will. So the primary use of the helicopter, even though it is, again, excuse my language, a sexy shot to see the dog jump. The primary use is a controlled training environment to replicate bad weather. Um, and could these dogs be deployed from helicopters? Absolutely. Have they been deployed? Yes, for exercises. So I just want to be very clear about that. The rescues to date are off of boats. They're from shore. Um, they're off of jet skis. Angel and I were on a jet ski where I literally have a straddle him and he's on the jet ski on a special platform. We're going around this lake in Italy and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Oh, the the Italian Coast Guard boat that I was on, um, that uh, and maybe it wasn't a Coast Guard boat, could have been an SICS boat, but this amazing woman's my hero. Her name is Donatella Pascale, and she's Ferruccio's right-hand man, but she's a woman. And she's been the vice president of SICS for the past 30 years. She's the most beautiful woman in the world, and she is... She's not young, and she is so strong. And we're in this boat, and she goes, Maria, and she doesn't speak that much English, and my Italian's not so good. She says, we're going to go very fast. Be calm for Angel. I'm like, okay. <laughs> very fast. 90-degree angle, sideways, upside down. My dog's fine. I'm like, yeah, mommy loves this. Um, because, of course, as you know, with dog training, you need to project the calmness that you want your dog to experience so you can't freak out. Here you see me. This is uh, me at the uh, Italian Coast Guard um, in front of the helicopter with Angel. This was an awesome experience just getting him acclimated to the noise, to the presence of it. Um, so we're, we're real excited about that. Can you tell us a little bit about Superpower Dogs, the IMAX movie? that uh has recently come out there's angel and we angel and i have been to the baltimore oh boy i don't want to say it incorrectly i don't where, where do we go i should probably get this accurately i don't know we've been to the baltimore museum of science we've been to in in maryland obviously because it's baltimore we've been to the virginia air and space museum and we were incredibly honored to be invited to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., and to give several talks on water safety prior to each showing of the movie. This movie is an incredible movie, and I heartily recommend it to everyone. I, it, it is this less than an hour tale of how these different dogs, how these different service organizations all over the world save and help us every day and i like this movie for so many reasons one it's just powerful and beautiful but two it raises public awareness that these dogs work every single day of the year and they don't get any money almost everybody featured in this movie represents a non-profit organization they're not getting paid the sics in italy is a pro civilian protection unit they don't get paid to do this. The the beautiful dog, Surf Dog Ricochet, who works with vets with PTSD and, and, and children with autism, she doesn't get paid to do that. The, the dogs in Africa helping to stop poaching, they don't get paid to do that. Halo, who's featured throughout the movie, she starts out as a little pup, she's a little Dutch Shepherd, and her mommy cat, who's this beautiful, powerful woman who works with the fire department somewhere, she teaches this dog to do search and rescue after fires. Again, she does this on her own time. So one of the big message in the film is to raise public awareness that nonprofits really need to be funded. And if they're not funded, they will ultimately go away. And people who are basically giving out of their heart and soul to help you and they're trying to do something of import that impacts humanity. We need funding. Um, I don't know when the appropriate time to talk about drowning is, but maybe here's a good time. You, there are 400,000 people a year who die every year from unintentional death by drowning. And that's from the World Health Organization. And the truth is that number's probably really low because a lot of third world countries don't 
properly report their statistics. We know from the Center for Disease Control here in the United States that 10 or more people in America die every single day from unintentional death by drowning. That's around 4,000 people a year, and it's 100% preventable. It's particularly tragic because it is a silent killer, and it's a silent killer two ways. It's silent because there's no public awareness. It's also silent because you don't usually drown, go and help me dog, save me. There are signs of drowning, which I'll bring up right now for anyone who's ever on a beach. If you see someone trying to climb out of the water, if you see someone with their head back, if you see someone go under silently, it's a sign of drowning. So what can you do? You, whoever you may be, if you're at the water's edge and you see these signs, you can alert authorities. You should not go and rescue anyone if you don't have training, but you can do things. If you have access to a flotation device, you can throw it. The Red Cross, the Red Cross says, throw, don't go, right? Don't go out there unless you're trained to do so because you don't want to add to the problem. Um, it's, a, it's a tragic situation right now because it's almost up there with malnutrition and malaria, but we don't have public outcry. We don't have public awareness about drowning. And when I said 400,000 people globally a year, what I'm not mentioning is eight to 10 times that many who are subjected to a drowning event, and even if they get rescued, may have permanent brain injuries, may have permanent serious complications. So there's, this is a huge number of people that are being affected by something that really could be eliminated. Um, so, so what, what do we want to tell people, people about people near the water? The water. What's the best the thing they say? say? Um, you know, I have so many brochures on this. I don't have one. I'm just going to talk. The, the best thing you can do when you're near the water is enjoy it. Have fun. Water's awesome. I want everyone to play in the water. I want everyone to have fun. But there's basic rules that are really simple, even though they're not always so exciting. First of all, don't swim in unfamiliar water. Second of all, learn to swim. In fact, let me say that one first. The leading cause of drowning is the lack of ability to swim. And I don't mean you have to be an Olympic swimmer. Just the ability to do a doggy paddle can help keep you alive. A lot of people, particularly sadly the disenfranchised, will introduce children to a, a water setting, an aquatic setting with no education. You need to learn to swim. So that's point one. Point two is any type of water activity outside of a pool that's supervised by a lifeguard should be done with a life jacket. Wear a life jacket. Even if you think it makes you not look cool, even if you think it's silly. Angel wears a life jacket. I wear a life jacket. I wear a, a wetsuit. So life jackets. And I can't, I know it's, again, it sounds overdone, but I'm going to say it out loud. Do not drink and kayak. Do not drink and swim. Do not drink and go out in the water. 80% of drowning deaths in the United States of America are grown men over 40. And they're grown men over 40, whether you like the statistic or not, because they get bombed and they go out on the water by themselves. And then they die. And we can stop that. We can eliminate that. Um, sadly, it's a leading cause of death in children. Um, particularly in the one to four, one to four years old, it is the leading cause of death other than congenital defects in children. And that's because moms and dads use a pool as a babysitter. A pool is not a babysitter. A pool is a place to be ultra vigilant with your children. Um, there's, there's other basic factors. Americans are at a great risk when they're traveling abroad. And that probably goes to the partying thing. I don't know that for certain, but they travel abroad and they swim in unfamiliar bodies of water and they're celebrating. So God knows how they're celebrating. And um, there's also other things. Autistic children are at a very high risk for drowning. And there's another way that we can help educate them and teach them. And this is where the dog can be very valuable in helping the child to understand the seriousness of playing in the water. Um, the, oh, oh, the There's so much to say about this topic. Cold water shock. Cold water shock is another leading cause of death. So in other words, it's getting hot and you wanna jump in the ocean 
So you go to the ocean and you jump in the ocean, but the ocean isn't hot yet. It's early summer and you jump in and the ocean's freezing cold and you can actually die of something called cold water shock. There's, there's so many things that we need to address, but the fundamentals are pay attention to lifeguards, wear a life jacket, don't drink and swim or do any kind of drug for that matter. Don't be impaired when swimming, whatever your personal things, I'm not even gonna judge you. Just don't be impaired when you're in the water. It's not a good place for it. And um, check the weather, swim with a buddy. I forgot that one. Don't swim alone, swim with another person. And um, honestly, it seems so simple and common sense, but you can break it down like that. Swim in lifeguard protected beaches. If you're going to take a risk, take a risk with a buddy, don't be impaired. Wear a life jacket, uh, look at the weather, know your surroundings. Um, and I could keep going, but we can all make a difference if we understand the signs of drowning, which are limited. It's hard to always spot. Be responsible. Don't try to save anyone's life without training, but let authorities know. And just just have, I, I don't want to sound like I'm saying don't go in the water. The water's awesome. Have fun in the water, but respect it and respect yourself. And I think that's awesome, awesome, awesome advice for everyone. Maria, Maria, can you please give us uh, the contact information for your American Academy of Canine Water Rescue if somebody wants to get in touch with you, if they're interested in more information about how to get involved? Absolutely. So you can reach me um, directly through email, Maria Gray at academyofwaterrescue.org. And that is a double R, Academy of Water Rescue. Um, you can also find me on the web at academyofwaterrescue.org. Um, I have a Facebook page. If you go to Facebook, you can type in the full name, American Academy of Canine Water Rescue, and I'll pop up. If you have trouble finding me on Facebook, you could also type in Maria E. Gray, G-R-A-Y. That'll bring in my personal page, which is heavily cross-linked to my Facebook awesome. business page. Thank you so much for being a guest today on our premiere episode and for just sharing all this wonderful information, not only about Newfoundlands and what you're doing with the SCIS and what you're doing here in this country for water rescue, but also water safety, which is super, super important for everyone. If you're interested in continuing the conversation with us in the second half, go to gooddogpro.com and uh, we'll be continuing with more information on this subject for our dog professionals. Thank you everyone for joining us. If you'd like to participate in the rest of today's conversation for professionals who work with dogs and receive continuing education credits from participating organizations for listening, visit gooddogpro.com and subscribe today. Use coupon PODCAST to get 40% off your first month or annual subscription.